And greetings. Happy Monday. Hope you had a great, long Independence Day weekend. I am Steve Dace here alongside Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. Coming up next hour on the show, it'll be your turn to ask me anything. We always look forward to that. In this hour, though, in lieu of what we normally do uh, with the opening montage and everything else, there have been um, uh, there have been some seminal moments that have occurred while we have been away politically. Defining moments for what is left of Western civilization and what it may or may not mean moving forward. And so because of that, I made the executive decision today that um, we are going to take a look at three big picture lessons that we need to learn from the elections in the UK, the elections in France, and then what is currently happening in the Democratic Party. And I'm going to spend the bulk of this hour discussing those three things to lay them out for you. My goal is that this hour will be so dense, you may have to listen to it a couple of times to catch it all. Because I think, I think that is how determinative the events that occurred this weekend may ultimately prove to be. That these were very revealing events about where these cultures are all at. And it's the old Andrew Breitbart line that politics flows downstream from culture. That is mostly true. It's, it's especially true on the right. Because we don't have a lot of leaders like a Ron DeSantis who has moved Florida to the right via his governance. Right? It's not like there was some massive spiritual revival in Florida. Right. Okay? He barely won, remember? Yeah. Do you remember the guy he almost lost to? Yeah. Yeah, he was literally ends up doing cocaine off a gay hooker's ass. Literally, literally, literally Correct. did that. Literally happened. Not a, not a Richard Pryor joke, which it is, but it's not even, but it really occurred. Okay. And he almost lost to that guy in the same state. And now, you know, four years later, this is the reddest state in America. And it's honestly not even close at this point. How? Well, what happened is by the force of will of his leadership, the culture has now followed him. That is actually what happens on the left. On the left, they can have they can gain power and appeal to a very small group statistically and the whole culture by the power of their will to power will then move to the left. On the right, we have to do 50 years of legwork to get one Roe v. Wade overturned. I mean, we, we have to do nearly a, nearly a century's work against slavery to get abolition, and that's after a civil war, okay? On the, on the right, it doesn't work that way. On the right, we've got to do a lot of terraforming in the culture to get the political system in mass to move. And that is why you hear me say a lot, we are not a nation of laws, and we never have been. We are a nation of political will, and we always will be. So my goal, you know, our primary goal on this show has always been the prime directive is a biblical worldview. That's going to be the prime directive we walk through here, which also includes seeing the prism of human history through a biblical worldview. You know, the Marxist will say history is the, the long arc of human history is the oppressor versus the oppressed. Wrong. The long arc of human history through a biblical lens is a righteous and holy God pursuing a fallen creation to redeem it despite its best attempts to reject him. That's actually the long arc of human history in a biblical worldview. Now, our biblical worldviews, arc of history, and the Marxist arc of history are parallel in which way? Not So it's almost as if these two worldviews cannot coexist at any point in time at any form of an apex in a culture simultaneously. You know why? Because they cannot. And some of these mo moments now where cultures have an opportunity to figure this out before it's too late, we're at hand over the weekend. And we saw how these cultures reacted. And so I think this bears a, um, a, a detailed conversation we're going to get into here in a moment. But first, if there was ever a day for me to promote this outstanding ministry, it is today. 
as you are watching the hierarchy of the Republican Party go out of its way to abandon those babies and abandon the pro-life principle that has been the driving force of any electoral success the Republican Party has had in the last 50 years. Make sure to invest your time and energy in causes who get it and are actually doing the work of the kingdom. And our friends at Preborn are doing that. And just like the kingdom, they model persuasion with truth and grace. There's a confrontation of truth. Moms are confronted with the knowledge that the being they are carrying with its own heartbeat via an ultrasound is another person. It's not a glob. It's not an inviolable tissue mass. It's a person. And in the hopes that they will choose life, and then when they do, now grace comes in. And they are there to support both the mom and her baby, prenatal, postnatal, sometimes for up to two years after birth, everything from car seats to counseling. But they do this all free of charge, which means they cannot do it without support from people like us. If you would like to make a tax-deductible donation today, send them the money you were going to send the worthless Republican Party today that doesn't care about these babies anymore. Send it to them. Preborn.com slash Steve. Plus, at least that one will also be tax-deductible. Your donation to the Republican Party that doesn't care about these babies anymore is not. Preborn.com slash Steve. So not only will you get the benefit of actually advancing the kingdom, you'll actually get a benefit within the earthly kingdom at the same time. Give the money to the Republican Party. You'll get neither one. You'll get nothing. Don't give it to them. Give it to these guys. Preborn.com slash Steve. That's preborn.com slash Steve. Or dial pound 250. Say the keyword baby on your mobile phone. Preborn.com slash Steve. All right. There are, I think, three situations that we need to look at here in depth. And I think we should take them in chronological order. Let's start in the UK, whose elections ironically occurred on our Independence Day. The result, the Tories had their worst loss of all time. It, it, it's, and it's deserved. And it was bound to happen. Here's the thing that we need to watch out for, though. Everything that is happening in the UK is what will happen here in anywhere from 5 to 25 years. Because depending on the trend or sector of a culture, that's how far ahead of us they are in the post-Christian era compared to us. I mean, we still have a church remnant that can at least somewhat slow the descent into the mouth of madness here in the States though that is fading, the, the UK does not even have that. I mean, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury is basically a Muslim at this point. All right, they, they don't even have that. They, they don't even have that. Like, you know, no one's Catholic in the UK and barely anyone's even Anglican or anything else. It, it's, it's spiritually dead. It's a dead country. Now, when I first started full-time in politics 18 years ago, I would have said that they were a full generation ahead of us. The problem is, though, once you start slouching towards Gomorrah, it really doesn't take long to make it a full-on sprint. Uh, The slippery slope is undefeated. This is why our opponents always say, don't make slippery slope arguments. It's for the same reason they say, make your arguments not the Bible. I mean, if I could get an idiot that I was was fighting and having a war with to take their most devastating weapon and mothball it for me, that's a great tactic, right? Yes. And we've been idiots and and said, you're right, uh, let's use statistics and other things. Idiots. Okay, we've been idiots for a generation. We've done this. Our enemy said, take the most devastating weapon you have. Take the the word of God that every tyrannical regime in human history has tried to snuff out and not let their people read. Tell you what, you guys take that thing off the table and then we'll be happy to come to the table and uh, and argue with you in the arena of ideas. And we're like, ah, bet, dumb, stupid. Which is why I've tried to use the show I have and the limited amount of talent God has given me as a cudgel to push it back into the argument. As Augustine to Spurgeon, many, many greats in the church have used this line. We're not really sure who said it first. It's been attributed from everyone to Augustine to Spurgeon to Luther to everybody. All right, but I would no more defend the word of God than I would defend a caged lion. Simply let the lion out of its cage. It will defend itself just fine.
So that's the same thing with slippery slope arguments. That's why they don't want to argue slippery slope arguments, even though they're undefeated. Because they know, they know, as we've been, we've been discussing in Romans, they know. They are a law unto themselves. They know. They have a God-given conscience. They know. They may have seared it. They may have hardened it. But they know nevertheless. That's why they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. That's why they don't like slippery slope arguments. Because once you start slouching towards Gomorrah, it doesn't take long before you're running it faster than totters and at the 5K for the elderly over the weekend. Didn't you win that thing? Congratulations. Win. I survived it better than others. (laughs) Wins a strong term. <laughs> well put. Well, you would have survived it even after 35 pounds a hell of a lot better than I would have. So congratulations on Thank that, you. brother. Yes. Way to show, the, way to show the, 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 those future Olympian uh, daughters you have that uh, the old man still got it oh, a little bit. Oh, they all bit. beat me by a lot. <laughs> okay. I'm trying here, but you're not letting me no, congratulate what? you at all. But anyway, congrats. Thank you. But it doesn't take long. Once we start slouching towards Gamora, we will sprint because we can't stop ourselves. We're incapable of doing this in our own flesh. We will eventually just end up with that Romans 1 crescendo that we did on Theology Thursday about a month and a half ago. Only revival from above stops this from happening. So what does that say about the UK elections and what does it portend for our not too distant future? Well, the right in the UK has been drifting more and more left since Thatcher. Just as it has here too since Reagan. It was then organically granted a populist uprising via Brexit to reset itself. Celebrities in England like Ringo Starr voted for Brexit. Everybody was fed up with funding the European Union. Everybody in England, except the elites who were in on the purposeful deconstruction and destruction of Western Civ, everyone else was like, we're tired of working for the Greeks. We don't want to do that anymore. And Brexit won. This was a moment for the Tories to reset reset themselves. Boris Johnson came to power full-on embracing Brexit and vowing to execute it. And the right here in America was offered the same reset as well via MAGA. A chance to break away from the corporatism that everybody hated, that kept the party in a perpetual state of civil war, that had a lot of voters like my mom, who's not a communist, is pretty socially conservative, but would never vote for any Republican just about because she thinks they are all corporatists who hate people like her. That should have been the moment to reset itself, like Brexit was the moment for the UK and conservatives, correct? And they both, by the way, happened the exact same year. Instead of taking advantage of it, though, what Boris Johnson did is he followed it up by embracing COVID madness. And then he got caught with his own administration how many times not even keeping the rules they were imposing on everybody else. Do you remember the day that we came in here and we were early on in lockdowns and it was the BBC, that bastion of right wing ideology. Do you guys remember this? We played a a documentary from the BBC on the air and reacted to it in real time where they were attacking Boris Johnson and lockdowns from the right. Do you remember this? Sure. And we were like blown away to see this. Okay. That's what happened. Christ's words that when the salt has lost its savor, it's of no use to anybody except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. The Tories have been drifting right or drifting left for so long. They had a chance now to reset themselves as a true real right alternative to the world economic forum globalist left. They rose to power because of it. And then they so ruined themselves that now the BBC is attacking them for harsh lockdowns from the right. And now if you look at, if you look at, by the way, is it kind of interesting? The guy who ends up replacing Boris Johnson Smooth talking Hindu dude with like no political experience at all. Hmm. Hmm. I'm trying to think of that. That sounds familiar. I got nothing. Let's move on. Anyway, um, the Tories, as they existed 
heading into election day in the UK on Thursday. We're basically to the left of where labor leader Tony Blair was 20 or 25 years ago. The right has done this here in America too, with limited exceptions like Florida, which moves further right post COVID. You saw the DeSantis team take that moment and move, take that moment and the trust they built by being dissidents against COVID. And now they have parlayed that political capital into moving the state demonstrably to the right. It's the most right wing state in the union. while the rest of the, uh, the right post-COVID madness moves left. And much of the right now is more liberal on mainstreaming homosexuality, um, overlooking and apologizing for excessive government spending, uh, more left-wing on crime than Bill Clinton was 30 years ago. We're, we're now, in this era, we are now attacking the crime bill where violent felons were told if you committed a third violent felony, that was three strikes and you're out. We're now being told that's racist on the right. We're being told that. There's not even a market to rein in government spending. Ron DeSantis got attacked by Trump from the left on you don't want to spend enough on entitlements. In the last primary. And at this point, like the whole thing with James O'Keefe, when it just, we were actually relieved that someone just had a heterosexual sex scandal on the right for a change. Someone at least around here, some major influencer still likes chicks. We breathed a sigh of relief. We're to the left of where Bill Clinton was 30 years ago. He left with a balanced budget, signing the Defense of Marriage Act, and an actual crime bill. When it was clear the UK right had no interest in being any form of meaningful opposition to the UK left, the UK people just embraced the fullness of the left. Just go with the real thing at this point. And the same thing will happen here too. If our right doesn't course correct. And it's going to happen here a lot sooner than I think a lot of you realize. This is why the 2022 election shook me. Because it was the first time in the two-party era that the failure of the majority party did not automatically benefit the party out of power. You know, that symmetry, congruency of the two. That symbiosis was gone. It was gone. And I was like, oh no. It means we're going to actually have to show we are willing to lead to win now. And if there's one thing I know about the Republican Party... It is not willing to lead. And keep in mind, you only get so many at bats. We've, we have already had more than three outs on the right with the American people. I don't know how many outs we're on, but it's more than three. And then sooner or later, man, they just pull the plug. And that's what they did in the UK. They had enough of the fake right and just said, we'll just go with the real left. Which brings me to France. So just as I pointed out that the Republicans in this country are in clear and present danger of following the Tories in England into some watered down political perdition, France provides the cautionary omen of what will happen if any semblance of a real right actually emerges here and threatens to systemically gain power. What do I mean by a fake right? Well, see, the Republican coalition is unsustainable. The center cannot hold. There are, we talked about this before. It's not a big tarp, right? It's a big tent, or not a big tent, but a big tarp, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Too many people slash factions who don't agree with one another on fundamental things. You and I do not want the same America Mitch McConnell does. We just don't. Now, I don't believe Mitch McConnell wants the same America Rachel Maddow does. But that's not good enough to sustain a coalition. You actually have to have some common vision, values. We don't. We have a common foe. That's an alliance. That's not a movement. Hell, you can, hell, FDR and Churchill can align with Stalin for a period of time if they have to, right? Yes. When that alliance, though, is at an end, what happened to the, uh, the relationship between the West and the Soviet Union? Did it remain chummy? It got cold. It got very cold. You can't have people who don't fundamentally agree with each other try to govern. This party cannot govern on a national basis. 
Every time it's been offered the chance, it fails to govern. Everything good Trump did except for the tax cuts, everything good he did, he did it all unilaterally. Couldn't get anything good through uh, wall building, none of it through the Republican Congress. A real Obamacare appeal, re- repeal, nothing. For example, the moment that the most successful Republican in my lifetime, Ron DeSantis, started running for president, he was getting enormous pressure to moderate from the donor class, especially on baby murder. Now, Trump is likewise moderating now, especially on baby murder, gave the worst answer on baby murder that any Republican has ever given in a presidential debate in American history. Why is he doing this? Well, one, he needs the donor class money bad. I mean, what he's had to shell out for this lawfare is, even for Trump, because they've also attacked his personal fortune, is substantial. So he needs the donor money badly to win. Secondly, it's also just closer to who he is. I mean, he's a lifelong New Yorker. And this explains why yesterday you saw two people that are mentioned uh, prominently to be his running mate, Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio made the, had the strongest pro-life messaging when he ran for president in 2016. Yesterday he was advocating we just get rid of all the pro-life stuff in the party platform. Marco Rubio did that. J.D. Vance, new Christian, he says. But he wants to make sure that the company that made Zyklon B, where they gashed the Jews with that, they're the ones that also make this abortion drug, because, you know, history doesn't just repeat, it also rhymes. He wants to make sure that's readily available. He said that on Meet the Press yesterday. Two-thirds of every baby murder in America today is chemical, telemed, this drug, which also has some dangerous side effects, by the way. Why are they doing that? Because that's what Trump wants. Now, what you saw in France yesterday is what should happen should the uniparty, or would happen should the uniparty truly fear a real right was going to gain control. So if you're wondering if Le Pen was going to turn out to be another Maloney, Notice we don't quick bait, we don't clickbait Maloney anymore. Have you have you figured that yes. out why? Because she sucks. That's why. She's a Pinterest for Ukraine. She sucks. That's why. Now the stops they went to to stop Le Pen indicates she was some form of a real threat. Because they have parliamentary elections in Italy too. They could have done this to Maloney, right? They didn't. What you saw is. If a real right were to emerge, and in the first round of elections, Le Pen's party won overwhelmingly, right? That was the first sign, okay, this could actually occur now. So what did the system do? The fake right just conspired with the Marxist in the spirit of the age to give up the ghost and just uniparty now out in the open. Just did it out in the open. Now, they're not Marxists themselves, but they'd much rather lose to Marxists than lose control of the system to people like us. I'll explain why in a moment. But on a personal level, this is what I learned. I learned this through being never Trump in 2016. And I just didn't recognize it until the night we interviewed Evan Evan McMullen. Remember that night? Yes. That was basically the night I was out. I wasn't in for Trump, but I was out. That was my last night, you know, where never Trump was a driving force on this show. And like a week or two before that, Todd, do you remember I was invited to a uh, off the record, closed door teleconference with Bill sure. Crystal? Okay. And I, I remember I joined that call and I listened what I told you after that call. I'm like, this is not going the way that uh, I thought it was going to go. Hmm. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. See, I joined Never Trump and Free the Delegates in 2016 because I thought I was saving the GOP from an untrustworthy guy with, quote, New York values. That was one of the taglines we came up on the Cruz campaign. Turns out this was mainly the Uniparty's attempt to pull a France for fear that Trump, more so his base, to be honest, represented true disruption, which Trump never truly has, unfortunately. It's sad, but he's actually not been the disruptor they feared. And he's not running as that now. There was supposedly a vision. I'd never even heard of it until they disavowed it, this Project 2025 or whatever it's called. Have you seen this? Yeah, that's one of the questions coming up in okay. the next hour. About I had not even heard of it, didn't know anything about it. I just saw it over the weekend when they disavowed it. I'm like, what is this thing? I'm like, this is a pretty dope platform. <laughs> okay. They're all out there saying it's not true. We don't, we're, we're standing for nothing other than we're just not Democrats. That's what they're trying. They're basically running right now the Romney 2012 campaign with Trump's persona. I think it will work as, a, as things stand today because of where the Democrats are, which I'll get into in a moment. It may work in November. I don't believe it'll work long term for what I'm about to describe and already have. 
It wasn't just that this group opposed Trump out of legitimate concerns. It's that they also preferred Hillary. And that's what I heard on that Bill Crystal call that night I was on. Now that's going too far. Most of that wasn't about principle. It was about the fact that Trump would bring new people to prominence in D.C. and they would lose power. Which is exactly why Macron did what he did in France yesterday. If a real right emerged and Le Pen, they thought there was at least a decent enough chance she represented this. His ilk are out forever. No one's ever going back to the fake once they've seen the real. Marxists, on the other hand, are going to be so bad. Now, why would Macron do this if he's not a Marxist himself? Let me explain right here. The Marxists are going to be so bad. It's been one day in France. They've already said we're going to recognize Palestine as a state and 90% tax rate. It's been one day, guys. One day. This is right out of Machiavelli's The Prince. It's literally a scene in The Prince where the people are clamoring that he's too violent and so he replaces himself with someone who's even worse so that the people will then come back to him and say, well, you come back. You look so much more reasonable. That's what Macron is doing. This is what the Uniparty will do. And so the Marxists, because they're true believers, they will go so far, the people will revolt and the fake right will be ushered right back in to just reasonably manage the decline all over again. That's what's happened all throughout the West, which is why these cycles never break. They go on and on and on. France and the UK are signs of the times that there, quote, are no political solutions, as the police once sang. We are boxed in, as tends to happen when a generation fails its calling to pass on what it inherited from the previous ones. And the West is in this hole because it has largely become godless. So only, therefore, by returning to God will it dig out. And we're back to our show's number one create, number one macro, revival or bust. Take a break there. Tell you about our friends over at My Patriot Supply, which maybe have never seen more attractive than they do at the last 24 minutes I just did. <laughs> right? Um... If you think you're prepared, you know, I just, we heard from our buddy Jesse Kelly down in Houston. Mm -hmm. They're getting uh, just annihilated right now. No power, nothing else. All right. Um, make sure you're prepared for these kinds of emergencies with My Patriot Supply. Get their popular four week emergency food kit. All right. Right now, uh, you can get yours at preparewithdace.com. That's breakfast, lunch, dinner, even drinks and snacks. The full repertoire of 2,000 plus calories of nutrition that you need per day. Uh, you can get it shipped to you for free as well and save $50 on each one when you go to preparewithdace.com. That's preparewithdace.com. All right. Don't miss out at preparewithdace.com. Aaron. Yeah, just wanted to let you know we'll have to go out without bumper music here, but that's the... Oh, you were trying to give me a signal. Yes. My bad. Okay. <laughs> that's the whole ball game. It always has been. We delude ourselves by thinking that there's any technocratic solution here. You can't technocrat your way to revival. That's just not possible. It starts personally, then in your own household, in your own church, hopefully, your own community. But that's the name of the game. It always has been. Don't delude yourself any other way. Truly, if you want lasting change, that's the only way. It's always been that way. Well, and to the degree that the people, the tech, the positions that are held by technocrats have uh, anything to say about our future, there's a whole segment of people that have let this become the church to their enemies and thought that they could get away with their on leisure time. You have got to be part of that uh, solution going forward. Yes, minimize its reach into your lives, but this is just going to happen all over again unless you are willing to stand a post at some point. Amen. Back in a moment. Of the show brought to you by our friends over at MD Hearing. It's an FDA registered rechargeable hearing aid, but it also costs a fraction of what typical hearing aids cost. In fact, their new Neo model, it's over 90% less than clinical hearing aids, and they fit just inside your ear. The Neo model does, so no one will even know that it's there. And MD Hearing just launched the Neo XS. 
the smallest hearing aid ever. How do they do this while cutting their prices in half? Well, it was founded by an ENT surgeon who saw how many of his patients needed hearing aids but could not afford them. So he made it his mission to develop a quality hearing aid that anyone could afford. MD Hearing is the culmination of that mission. So get the hearing you deserve at prices these days you can afford. Go to shopmdhearing.com. Use the promo code Steve to get their new $297 when you buy a pair offer. That is, that's, you're just not going to find anything this high a quality that inexpensive, folks. You're just not. Plus, they're adding a free extra recharging case as well. It's a $100 value just for our fans here at The Blaze. That's shopmdhearing.com. Use the promo code Steve to get this incredible offer. Promo code Steve at shopmdhearing.com. Promo code Steve at shopmdhearing.com. All right, so we're working outside in here this hour. And again, the hope is I'm I'm going through a lot of this, and this is going to be so dense you got to go back and listen to it for the, a, a couple of times because we want to make you, you know, the biblical worldview is our prime directive, but one of our secondary objectives is to make you more of a critical thinker and more discerning in how the political process and culture really work. All right. So in the UK, we, we basically saw the Romney people. In fact, let me just simplify it that way. In the UK, we basically saw the Romney people take control move the party way to the left to the point that there was no point to even having this party and the country just went full throat left. Is that a fair analogy? Sure. In France, what you saw is they viewed Le Pen the way the system viewed Trump in 2016. This is a real disruptor, or at the very least, the people he's going to bring to power with him, and in her case, her, will be real disruptors. So we have to align with the system to not let that happen. That's what never Trump ended up being really about. For every Mike Lee and Ken Cuccinelli and Steve Dace that was involved in Free the Delegates, turns out after the convention we learned we were way outnumbered by a bunch of people who are really um, disgraceful rhinos. So it was really just about stopping these, uh, this new element from replacing them in power on the right, the fake right. And that's what Macron did. Cut a deal with the Marxists. A bunch of Macron's people resigned just to give up their seats so they couldn't have enough seats for Le Pen's party to win. And they know. They know the communists are going to be so bad. We're one day in. We're one day in in France. And they promised a 90% tax rate uh, to make um, Arabic an official language of France. I forgot about that one. Did you see that one too? Yes. 90% tax rate, Arabic an official language, and... Um, uh, what was the third? What was the other one I mentioned last hour? Do you remember what it was? It was bad. Oh, it was. Um, I can't remember now. But it, it, this is the stuff yeah. that is basically like our caricatures of them, and they're like doing it now. They're just going to do it. And and the Macron people know that this would the people of France will think this is going way too far. And they will beg for the fake right to return, to reasonably manage the decline better at an acceptable rate. It's Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Chaos is a ladder. Mm -hmm. So this brings us to what's happening here at home. The next lessons we have to learn. Because we are now on day 10, 11, I've lost track, of the Democrat media industrial complex's attempt to drive Joe Biden out. Now, here on the right, nothing we say or do will determine the ultimate outcome one way or the other. The dumbest people on the right, dumbest. I don't care who they are. I don't care if we've been friends. You're dumb. It's a dumb take, okay? Sitting around saying, if we, if, if we will do this, they'll just, they won't get rid of, they'll keep, they will get rid of Biden because we want him. They don't care what we think. They don't give a rip. How much of, uh, of, uh, Ben Shapiro's commentary on the matter, do you think Jerry Nadler consumed last night before he came out and said, Joe Biden's got to go? How much do you think it was? I'm, I'm sure old Nads, I'm sure Nads was right on the precipice, man. And then he heard what I had to say a week and a half ago. And it was just like, oh, we got to move, guys. They don't care what we think. All right. Nothing anyone says or does on the right is going to determine the outcome of this at all. Nevertheless, there are some important things I think we would be wise to learn as we observe this process play itself out. Number one, this is what a real movement looks like. They are united together in both message and deed. 
I mean, they're actually telling the truth. Now, <laughs> while not admitting they've been lying all along, <sighs> Biden's got dementia? <laughs> the press feels betrayed, I'm told. Yes, I, I don't know how people like Jake Tapper sleep at night, and you know what? I don't want to know. Because I'm, I'm hoping that... that um, that by the grace of God, I don't spend eternity with people like that. Or that they repent so that um, they don't end up where people who behave like that go. But it's, it's amazing to see when they want to tell the truth. Have you guys seen like the logs of, in, in the big print? I mean, they're leaking everything to show what a shell game this has been the whole time while lying to us about the fact they were in on it the entire time, okay? My wife and I loved the Dean Cain, Lois, and Clark with Terry Hatcher. We loved that show. When we first got married, we watched like every episode together. And our favorite episode is the one where Lois finally finds out that Clark is Superman. And she finds out because H.G. Wells jumps in a time machine, okay, and, and he's looking for the smartest journalist in the world, and it's Lois Lane, and he cannot believe she doesn't know. She can't just look at Clark Kent and realize, and, she's, and he's like, glasses on, glasses off, glasses on, glasses off. How did you not, you're the smartest journalist in the world, you didn't figure this out. That's the whole gag of the episode, okay? Yeah, okay. Dementia on, dementia off, dementia on, dementia off. You didn't know? Come on. Number two, this is all being driven by their desired outcome. Now, we're driven by desired outcomes too, but our desired outcomes are usually primarily industrious in nature, which is why there's going to be a lot fewer people calling out J.D. Vance than calling out Marco Rubio. It's a lot safer for your bottom line to call out someone who's not certified MAGA fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. So a lot more people are going to call out Marco Rubio in our industry today than are going to call out J.D. Vance. And an even fewer number are going to call out the Godfather for this. Because it just doesn't help your bottom line to be that honest with our own people. Because the people are the biggest grifters of them all. The customers are. Theirs tend to be primarily ideological. That's the desired outcomes that they want. So we tend to go with what will advance the bottom line first and foremost. Uh, for them, the agenda in obtaining and maintaining power to pursue that agenda is their bottom line. That's their bottom line there. And you're seeing that now. David Axelrod was out 11, it was out that the first weekend after the debate. Guys, we have to close ranks. He's a sitting president, nothing we can do. David Axelrod 24 hours ago, Biden is completely divorced from reality. It's far more likely he's going to lose in a landslide and, and then win this thing. In the end, the agenda for them is the agenda. Our agenda is secondary to us. Number three, this kind of courage of conviction that we rarely demonstrate, but will have to consistently to have any chance of winning the culture war is what they are doing right now. Uh, they may not be ultimately successful in driving out a sitting president. I think they will, but they may not be. But at the very least, they have demonstrated a persistence that is light years beyond what we have shown we are capable of. If we had tried something like this on the right, it would be over the minute some major influencer jumped on Fox News to declare it dead. And that would have happened like close of business day two. Because the threat of denial of platform, uh, future access would overrule the principle. A lot of you are just now finding out that the Trump campaign is trying to take the pro-life stuff out of the platform. This has actually been going on for the last three months. And I've had, I've had major evangelical leaders tell me this. So why haven't I been talking about it constantly? Because what I told them was, if you guys want to come, isn't that what I said? If you guys want to come on, I'll give you the platform. But I'm done. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Steve. Steve, grab the flag, charge the hill, and then I'll look back. Where's my backup? What do you mean, we Lone Ranger? Nope. So what did I tell you when this came up again three months ago? If they want to come on, we'll put them on. But we're not going after this headfirst right. again. And then all these people stay quiet and silent. 
so they can maintain their access while we take all the bullets for them and get nothing in return. Not doing that anymore. Nope. Not happening. By the way, did any of them take up our offer to come on yet? No. No, is the answer. No. Now, all of a sudden, that the deed is basically done to the point the VP candidates are saying we can't be pro-life anymore. Now, all of a sudden, they want to fight when it's too late. It's too late. Conventions next week, you lost. Why didn't you do it? The Why weren't you out there publicly on all these shows two or three months ago? Because it would have hurt some people's social standing to do that. You might not get your convention speaking slot. I know of one major evangelical leader who in 2016, in one day, met with a bunch of the Free the Delegates people we can't have Trump as the nominee. He turned right around at the, and then endorsed Trump that afternoon and got to speak that night. They don't do stuff like that over there, man. They, oh, they clown themselves like, you know, Joe Scarborough's clowning himself. But it's all an advancement of an agenda. Mm -hmm. The agenda is, can Joe Biden win this election for us or not? And on the days that they think he can win, to maintain their agenda they have one position and on the days that they don't think he can win to maintain their agenda they have another you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. they, they have a they're they're now their compass is pointed due south brother if you know what i'm saying gee you know where you're picking up when i'm laying down I there do. oh, it's pointing due south but it's pointing somewhere right our compass is all over the place i mean our compass is, is like if you walked into a zero grav room with a compass and looked around and just the thing just moves from end to end. You don't know where it is. The double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Their compass is pointed due south. If you know what I mean. But at least it's pointed somewhere consistently. I mean, these people are doing this. Guys, they've reduced a sitting president of the United States to call in this morning in, in between oatmeal droplets. Yeah, Joe! If the, I'm the president, but if the elites and the party won't come after me, Joe, at the convention, I'm going to the convention with our does. They're just not like us. You cannot analyze them as you would us. They're way more persistent, ruthless, and want to win way more than we do. Which brings me to my fourth point here. Yes. It is easier for them to stay on mission and message, given they control so much of the media and so many more of the institutions. But, and yes, those entities reinforce their efforts while opposing steadfastly opposing ours. That's all true, but that's not the excuse that we think it is. For guys, how did they get this power? How did they, how did they get this hegemony? Was it granted to them? This did, they, did, they, did, they, did, they, did they grab a genie? They were just moseying along on the, on, at the corner of Haight-Ashbury after the Cal Berkeley faculty summit and lo and behold they came upon a genie and they rubbed it 666 times and the demon came out and granted them the wishes that what happened no this no they friggin took it from us my, they took it they point. friggin took it from us that's what they did and worse they often even didn't have to we just gave it to them we just didn't show up. We just didn't preach this stuff. We just quit. And nature abhors a vacuum. No, that's not the excuse we think it is. Like, I don't want to hear any more. They steal another election with illegal aliens and everything else. Nothing. I've got no tolerance for it. I don't want to hear. You can't beat the dementia retard. Get the hell out. All of you. Every last one. And I'm naming names. If that happens, November 6th. Mark my words. Mark it down. Mark the tape. I'm naming names. Got to go. All of you. Can't beat a dementia retard. Get out. And you had four damn years. Instead of releasing Krakens and stealing money from people from stop to steal and then admitting under oath under con to Congress, you, this wasn't going anywhere and you knew it. You had four damn years to do something about this. You did nothing. You lose to these twerps again. It's all you. No more excuses. Just win, baby. No, that's not an excuse that they have all this infrastructure. They took it from us. They took it away. This country is founded on our worldview. It was the institutions were established by our belief systems and traditions and customs. They took it from us. That's not an excuse. It's an indictment. Which brings me to Luke 16, 8. Some of you may know this. 
as one of Jesus' parables. Christ says, quote, The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. There's a book of the Bible called Ruth. Many of our weddings cited. My wedding did. It's my wife's chosen wedding verse for us. The main character, Boaz, basically, for lack of a better term, tricks a dishonest man into giving him Ruth for a wife. Just tells him, hey, she's got a mother-in-law. She's a Moabitess. You don't want her. No, she's got a mother-in-law, right? Mm -hmm. And she was a Moabitess. That's true, right? Mm -hmm. Now, he left a few details out. Like, you know, she's repented and said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. That's the, you know, she's repent. You see, yeah, I mean, she left that part out, you know, comes with land and is wealthy, left that part out, you know, left all that out because he loves her. Figured that the kinsman redeemer just wanted her for property, didn't really love her. So how did God respond to Boaz? Basically tricking the kinsman redeemer into letting him take Ruth for his wife. How did God respond? Well, he responded by the son that they had. Uh, put him in the lineage to the Messiah, Christ. Blessed him, in fact. Shrewdness. Now, shrewdness is not betraying your principles. That's cowardice. That's treacherous. Shrewdness is sometimes you tell people who are obviously in the enemy's camp as much truth at a given time as they need to know. Why is the serpents? and innocent as doves. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Aaron McIntyre, Totters, and all of you. And you can let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Just email us, Steve, at SteveDace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. You can also follow me at Steve Day Show on uh, Twitter or X, uh, and also at uh, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And then don't forget, if you listen to the podcast version of the show, uh, please remember to leave us a five-star review if you like us. We are less than 400 away from 10,000 of those on iTunes, which would be really cool. So thank you for each and every one of them. You can also hit subscribe, or if you are listening via iTunes, hit follow. And that means every time we do a new episode, it will show up in your podcast feed every single time. And we thank all of you that have done that for us as well, as we thank our friends over at Raycon that have come out with, and I've tried a lot of different brands, the best fitting uh, earbud uh, headphones and um, noise reducing uh, earbud headphones I've ever had. And they're incredibly popular at our house, which is why when I tend to get to a new pair from the company, uh, it tends to disappear. And then I see a teenager, maybe, using them like a week or two later, right? Um, so upgrade your everyday earbuds, and uh, now you can also get active ergonomic design, multi-point connectivity that lets you pair with two devices at once, and active noise cancellation as well. Um, 32 hours of battery life. It's got a new quick charge function. 10 minutes of charging yields 90 minutes of battery. You can't beat it. These are just outstanding earbuds. They've got so many other outstanding products as well. So you can go to buyraycon.com slash Steve today. Get 15% off your entire Raycon order plus free shipping. Again, that's buy Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash Steve. Get 15% off when you go there off your entire order and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash Steve. All right, before we get to Ask Me Anything, Todd, you have been uh, uh, forced to be rather quiet here for the last hour, so I thought I'd give you a chance to chime in on any of the lessons I just uh, droned on and on about uh, before we find out uh, what the audience wants us to discuss for the remainder of the program. Oh, it's it's not droning. Um, only pray that there's ears to hear i i actually had a dream this weekend uh that very explicitly told me i needed to bone up on uh my huxley's brave new world it's like man that's 
That's one you don't want to wake up to. Yeah, we're um, we're on we're on autopilot that is unsustainable. I mean, Steve didn't. I, I know Jesse Kelly's doing it. You just you just retweeted something earlier today about the uh, interest rates. Oh no, mar- mortgages, home mortgages, right? Didn't you? Yes. I mean, there's. I, pick, they were already a hundred percent more. Uh, uh, now a mortgage payment is in America on average than it was the day Joe Biden took over, but the, the, the news continues to get even worse. So, of course, you are right. We we absolutely, we refuse to let the lion out of its cage. We were embarrassed about it. Look at what we just got to talking about Romans 1. I mean, before the bad part gets in there, Paul just saunters in there to the capital of the universe and says, yeah, we're, we're going to take all this thing. I am not ashamed of the gospel. We've done the opposite thing here. But then the rubber band bouncing back, the common sense kind of thing, the thing that all three of us on various different days regarding COVID, uh, people thought about regarding transgenderism, common sense is going to kick in. But if it won't even, if it's not even the economy stupid anymore, Steve, the the level of demonic interference it, it is such that, again, gr- you were right to try for one hour using three different outposts of Western civilization to try to grab people by the scruff of the the neck and say, wake up. But um, time is running late. And if it's, if guys like Steve Dace and Jesse Kelly can't, I mean, because listen, let's face it, they, they, those are two guys who have communicated to you and in every man's way uh for quite a while now and if even that won't snap you out of this i I just i don't know what will anymore this again what we're witnessing these should be instructive moments what happened in the uk what happened in france what is happening now with joe biden These should be instructive moments. But I want to reiterate one very important part of this. The center cannot hold on the American Rights Coalition. And I'm not even using the term conservative anymore because that's lost all meaning. You have the godless right, which I think has just permeated the water table of, of the American right. Now, it's still a big country. There are still amazing exceptions to those rules there are still pockets of this country where it is as if it was back in the you know 50 years ago it's still that way because of the heritage what have you but in mass at a national level the american right is not really fundamentally at least in the nuts and bolts of how power is wielded if it is wielded at all it's not fundamentally different from the left because At a national level, the Republican Party, my entire adult lifetime, most of the adult lifetimes of Todd and Steve, they have seeded seeded ground on first things. What are first things? Well, we had an example of that. This is not a new phenomenon in the Republican Party. I've heard this my entire adult life as well. We need to moderate on baby killing, moderate on baby killing, or at least not address it. I've heard that my entire adult life as well. And now it's even worse now that Roe is overturned. It was always, you could always pivot to for the last 20 years plus, 20, 40, almost 50 years, you could always pivot to, if you didn't want to get into nuts and bolts of which babies should be allowed to live and which babies should be made to die, you could always just pivot to, well, nothing we can do. We've got to get Roe overturned. You could always pivot to that. And now that that, now that that facade, that fig leaf is gone, now it's, well... I guess we can kill some of the babies after all. That was really the heart of the Republican Party for the last 40 years anyway. So that's just one thing. That's a first thing. You're not fundamentally different than the American left. Because you've ceded ground, you've capitulated on first things at a national level. So that is the message here. So many will elections. This one is the same as well. Well, the Democrats are just so bad. The Democrats are just so bad. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was that true? Yes, the Democrats are just so bad. But it enabled us to get and elect worse Republicans. That's the enabling. 
now we're really at the juncture of the Democrats really do just want to wipe us all out, put us in camps if they don't kill us first. The left wants to do that. But we've been left by watering down first things for a generation. We've been left with an alternative that is feeble, as feeble as Joe Biden is in his mind and brain. The alternative is just as feeble because we've spent a generation watering down first things. And now we're just a ragtag coalition of people who are just not the left. That's not a value. It's not a value. We don't have any values. That's why we're not able to paint a picture of a better, bolder future. Never have been. The only picture we're able to paint is we're red, they're blue. Vote for us. Can't win in the long term. There's a lot more we could say about this. Um, I did Shan enjoy our good friend show over Independence Day weekend. We got into some of this. You should go and listen to that if you get a chance. I think her show's on Rumble. But let's table it for now and get to the audience questions, okay? And I'm sure some of the audience questions will end up being about some of the areas we would have mm-hmm. covered anyway as a follow-up, all right? So it's time to ask me anything. Todd has selected the questions. I did accidentally see one question, mm. and I answered it on our Facebook page. Oh. It just popped up as I was scrolling down the page, and then I realized it was in this thread, so my apologies, okay? But I did not see any of the other, you know, over 100 questions that were submitted in the thread, all right? So, Todd, you have determined which ones we're going to be uh, trying to get through here yes. during the show. Aaron, you have the questions. Let's let it rip. We'll go to Lori Jean first, who asks, what do you know about Project 2025? I, I didn't know anything about it. I, I just saw a bunch of people discussing it and disavowing it over the weekend. I saw one thing that claimed to be Project 2025. I don't know if it's real or not, um, but if 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 it was real, it was real and it was spectacular. Okay, this would be like, you know, the Steve Day Show checklist of things. Okay, so I, I don't know what's true and it, what's being disavowed and what was real and how much of this was, I, I have no idea. And, um, you know, we're just in an era, unfortunately, where we're just as likely to be gaslit by the people who uh, are on our wearing our own jersey as the people on the other side. So I, I really don't know what I know. You I see know. the guys in blue polos and khakis are marching around Nashville again in masks. So yes. um, it's just the, yeah, the, the feds only production yes, yes. or the only feds. Yes. Yeah. Next, we go to Dana Henry, who asks, if the government is of the people, by the people, for the people, why do we put so much stock into JFK's statement, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country? These statements seem contradictory. I think this mentality helped lead to some of the COVID madness. Um, It seems contradictory because the social compact is broken, and it wasn't broken when JFK said that. All right. So the the social compact in America can be summed up by the phrase e pluribus unum. Out of many, one. All right. So that was essentially the social compact. So how was that originally applied? Well, originally at 13 colonies, each of them founded, inspired, governed um, some combination of those three words by a vestige of the Christian church. Every single one of them. Um, One was the only one that was not directly founded or inspired that way was still indirectly done so that was Rhode Island which was done which was founded to be a place where Christians of all forms of orthodoxy could feel free in order to um, come and live all right and so like the first time the phrase uh, separation of church and state is ever uttered in the American lexicon there's a group of Baptist in Danbury Connecticut that are upset the congregational church is the official church of the state of Connecticut and they are concerned that the, that they will not be able to have full civic a- access to full civic affairs as Baptists. So they write a letter to Thomas Jefferson, basically asking him to intervene for the federal government to intervene. And Thomas Jefferson says, you don't want us to set that example. You do not want the federal government setting the example that we are going to intervene in your denominational fights at a state level. And he said, in fact, the Constitution implies a thin wall of separation of church and state. Why did he use that phrase? Comes right out of the Protestant Reformation. Guys like John Knox. John Knox. All right. The, the idea that, you know, bishops, we don't sell the office of bishops to kings and we don't sell, um, you know, kings can't gri- grift their way into church ecclesiastical offices. It comes right out of the Reformation, that idea. That's what he's referring to. So that's the first time this phrase is ever uttered in American history in any form of official document. 
So the expectation was originally that the Catholics in Maryland and the Quakers in Pennsylvania and the Episcopalians in Virginia and the Congregationalists in Connecticut and the Baptist in Georgia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would come together out of many, one, to form one union. That's what it meant, okay? Later, it got applied more broadly, all right? We went through waves of immigration, for example. And so... Hey, I remember when I was a kid, you know, before I even knew my ancestors were Italian and Sicilian, I remember seeing the commercials for Prince Spaghetti Day. Remember those commercials Mm -hmm. where the kid is running home for Wednesday is Prince Spaghetti Day. All right. So you kept your cust, you kept some customs from the old world, but you wanted to be an American. And it was actually considered the ghetto. The original ghetto was actually that you were being relegated to the neighborhood of your ethnicity and could not have upward mobility. That was a social stigma to do that. It was, a, it was actually considered we were, that you were being kept down if you remained in Little Italy, okay? That you were being denied the upward mobility that should be available to you as an American. The desire was to assimilate. This language is found in many of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches. We don't need to lionize him. He wasn't a perfect man by any means. We also needed to lie about him either. Okay? Complicated figure like pretty much everybody else is. But if you look at the content of his speeches, he is calling for the e pluribus unum to now, a century after slavery is ended, to be granted to black Americans. He's not condemning America's foundings and cherished traditions. He wants, he wants to claim them, access to them, and say, hey, we worked those fields. We built those railways. We, we shared those crops. We picked the cotton. We, I mean, this was built on the sweat of people with my melanin level. We get access to that legacy too. Now, what has happened in an era where, social, where the social compact is broken, okay, is now it, we, we are seeking to desecrate these traditions. And that's why it seems contradictory to you now. Like if I was alive... 100 years ago, and someone came up with the idea of a national service for young people, I probably would not have opposed it. Now I'd vehemently be against it. Why? Because the social compact is broken. And so here's what national uh, service for young people will mean. It'll mean I spend the expense out of my own pocket of paying taxes for the seats in schools my kids never attended, and then I double spent it by paying for them to be homeschooled or Christian schooled, only to then have them go into national service and wave the rainbow flag and be taught drag queen story time hour is a blessing of liberty. See what I'm saying? I'm a hell no on that. A hundred years ago, would I have had to worry about something like that? No, no. We were e pluribus unum a hundred years ago, right? So the idea of of a shared service to the national ideal based on a culture whose values we all pretty much share to some degree wasn't contradictory, let alone anathema. It is now. That's why when she typed out this message, I'm pretty sure she when she says "ask not what your country," every time she says "country," she reads "government." Correct. Because the social compact is broken. They didn't think that in 1960 or really any other era before that. I mean, when you and I were kids, if a country from Russia invaded a nation that was that bordered a NATO country, we would have been we're America, bitch. And when did the missiles start flowing? You see, that's what we would have done. But now we're not in that world anymore. We're not in that culture anymore. And we just saw a lot of those NATO countries um, uh, lock their people down, try to steal their farmland right now as we speak, by the way. Uh, And that's when they weren't poisoning all of them and telling them, if you didn't take more and more of the poison, you couldn't actually live any different than Putin let you live in Russia. Fair? Okay. And so now, now that that's who these countries are, what do I care about who controls the playground or the reverse Wakanda, as you put it, of Ukraine, whether that would be, I, I think it sucks what's happened to the people there. I also think it sucks what happens to the, the, to people and nations where, where warring tribes in Africa are yes. killing people, but we're not being demanded to go in there and 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 and, and spend trillions of dollars to in, to referee those inter Nicene fights. So what's so special about reverse Wakanda that we have to do it here? It's because this is not a battle of national interest, but global ones whose global dialectic will be furthered, Vladimir Putin's or Davos's. And for me as a Christian, guess which side of that fight I have? I don't. I don't. Any more than I would have had a fight, a side in the fight between the Edomites and the Philistines. I don't. Hey, Steve, who do you prefer? Pilate or Herod the Idiomean? Negative, Ghost Rider. I'm in another kingdom. I'm doing something else.
So that's why it seems contradictory now. It is because our social compact is broken. But a generation ago, it would not have. Good question. Next, we go to Daryl Cordray II, who says conservatives have been complaining for more than a generation that the Republican Party is moving left on too many issues. Isn't it about time we as a movement form a new party? Yeah, it's going to take time, but we can't even get Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy Republicans to demand that the 25th Amendment be invoked. By all means. I mean, I... To me, we're, this is where grace must abound, and we're just in strategic... I mean, I'm, I work here on a show where I have two men I greatly respect and whose abilities I value enough that I pay them out of my own pocket. I don't have to do this. And I pay them well. And if the election were today, I'm not, I don't think it's a lockstep that we're all going to make the exact same decision. Correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. So... We, we need grace abound. I don't know what the right solution is. I, I really don't. Other than revival. Short of revival, I, I don't know. And I, and I think, I mean, I, I just don't, I, I just think for me, the bottom line is this. We had Abrahamic Accords and not stupid wars. Um, we had way more border security and not being flooded with who knows how many millions of foreign invaders as we currently are. We had energy independence and every economic marker was better when, when Trump was in power than right now. And I just don't think this is sustainable. I don't think there is a long-term path either way other than revival. So I'm just trying to maintain, I, I'm doing this for the same reason I risked everything for Ron DeSantis' candidacy last year. It's what I think is best for my children and grandchildren and I can... And it's the best stewardship of the platform and the, and the mission that God has given me. That I think, but I could be wrong. I, I don't know. And trust me, I have reservations every day, like when I see Trump as we speak, taking the pro-life uh, planks that nobody cared about anyway, but symbolically they do mean something, taking them out of the party platform. When I see Melania has been politically quiet for the last four years, except to celebrate the rainbow jihad. And if you're there and you're like, that's why I'm out... What kind of an argument from me do you think you would get? None. None would be the answer. If you're like, Steve, the guy, you're the, you're, you yourself have said the guy made two of the worst mistakes in the history of the presidency. I can't, I can't give him another chance. What argument would you get from me? None. None. The only way you get an argument from me is when you miscategorize my position and, and do so by totally bypassing the stuff he actually did. See, Trump was president. Everybody on every side of this wants to pretend he never was. His grift core wants to pretend he never was, so he can't be held accountable for his mistakes. And the haters want to pretend he never was, so he can't be given credit for any successes. Well, if you want to know where the Steve Day show is going to land on any issue, come up with what is the least easy to monetize position, and that's probably where we're going to land, okay? Because these are both idolatries, and they're both wrong. He was president, has a record, he made those mistakes, and gets credit for those successes. If, in your view, his failures outweigh his successes, you should not vote for him. And you'll get no argument out of me. All I ask is the same grace is extended both ways. We don't share the same opinions on this show. I am paying these two men well who disagree with me. We're also not at each other's throats over this on a daily basis either. Why? Because grace has to abound in such an era. There's going to be... So how does that apply to your question? I don't believe we have the time, given where the enemy currently is, for a long-term play other than revival. If we're going to make a long-term play, then I think we should just honestly, at this point, just let the political system do what it must and go into almost entire culture-building evangelistic mode. And if, you, if that's your play, again, how much argument will you get out of me? None. Okay? I, I, I don't think we have time for this. I don't. Agreed. Now... You may disagree. I could be wrong. If you want to go down that path, Godspeed, and I wish you will. I just don't believe we have time for this. I don't. And the events over the weekend in the UK and France are further hastening my conclusion where this is concerned. But you may disagree, and I want you to be right. 
I mean, I've, you know, I spend a lot of time with my granddaughter this weekend. I don't want to sit here and be right about the fact we don't have a lot of time for stuff like this. I'd like to be wrong. So by all means, go out there and prove me wrong. I, I will, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'll root you on. I, I just think it's, I don't think at this stage, it is a good use of the resources God has given me to champion that message because I think it has little to no chance of being successful. But again, that's my analysis. I'm a human being. I'm a sinner. I'm not an oracle. Okay. I'm not a capital P prophet. I don't know. You know, so if that's your play, I wish you well. I included this because I figured you would get to that point. I also think we haven't learned a lesson if we're asking this question on the, when you say, should we start a new party? We need to work on the we part. <laughs> well, that's too. We, we're, whatever new parties start, they're going to learn to use and abuse us just like the old parties did because the we really sucks right now. Even if we even if we believe a lot of the right things, most of the right things, all the right things, the execution on the we part, ugh, man, we 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 got no game. That's that's the real problem. We can we cannot just be clapping seals, hoping somebody else do it. The we needs to go over there. Next, we go to Joanna Lutz, who asks, do you think there will be a terrorist attack during the Olympics this year, a la 1972 Munich, or more like the 1996 Atlanta Games? Well, where are the Olympics? Paris, France. Where are they having a mass of, 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 of uprisings right now? Paris, France. Which country just elected a government that said it's going to uh, acknowledge uh, Palestine as a legitimate state and make Arabic one of its official languages? That one. That's my answer. I even have visions of them just like holding events hostage. Like just, you know, you're not entering, you're not going in until you pay the the tithe of the day. I mean, honestly, this the, has the, become the, chaos. The whole shtick that I have been repeating over and over again, like a mantra about analyzing the Democrats the way you would us, you cannot do that. Yeah. They're not. The same thing applies even more so when we get into theology. All right. The Muslims are not like us. The temptation of Islam has always been to push too hard for its mission of dominion. The temptation of Christianity has always been to not push hard enough, to syncretize, to settle. Comfort is the soul killer. It's the other way around. All right? They, if anything, to glorify, not, not, have you ever read the Quran? The whole thing is not just we're slitting throats. There's some beautiful language in there. But the, the long arc of Islam is to elevate Muhammad's more violent, crude, crudish, or crude tendencies. The long arc of Christianity is to feminize Christ. So they're not like us. So here's what we would do. We would take a new government in France that, that said we're going to recognize one of your geopolitical states is a real country and your language is an official language. And we would take that to mean, oh, we're making progress here. You know, we're good. We'd settle. They're not like us. They will take it as weakness. That's why the leftists got the election result they wanted. They're the ones destroying the streets of France as we speak. And we look at that and we're like, dude, you guys won. No, they didn't. They haven't won yet. Not everybody's under their, uh, under their boot. And they're emboldened. So they've got momentum. We have momentum. We're like, I guess that means now that we can actually just put it in cruise. They get momentum. We're like, we need sharper blades. That's how it works. So it's actually way more likely there's going to be a terrorist attack because of the level of weakness that the French have shown than there, was, than there would have been 72 hours ago because they're emboldened. They are just, they're, the Kufa are even cl are, are close to being conquered now. That's what they're saying to themselves in their own channels, in their own places, in their own enclaves in Arabic. The Kufar are hanging by a string. They're trying to negotiate their way out, but Allah has given us the victory. Press on to the attack. We would be like, well, Jesus told us to be nice now, which he never did, by the way. Never did. Never happened. Never told you to be nice like ever, actually. So there's that. Not like us. You know, just like the, the just like the left likes to analyze the world absent of God and the Word of God, <laughs> we like to analyze the world like everybody is like us, and it's they're not. There are people that have real conviction; they're wrong, 
but real conviction that we just simply don't have. And so they just don't see things the way that we do. They don't see this as progress. They see it as they're close to unconditional surrender. And that's progress. All right, we've got a minute and a half left. I think we can get this one in here. Uh, Matt Cooper says, do you ever feel like permanently checking out of political commentary? I listen to stuff all the time. And although I feel it's important to be in the know, I also am just over it. Sure. But ultimately, uh, the, b- the biblical worldview to me is our prime directive and political commentary is a means by which to do so. I spent a lot of time this morning on X engaging people who think I've sold, I'm selling out by voting for Trump. I hope I tried to do this respectfully because I didn't want it to come across as I'm angry or self-righteous. It was, I was having a theological engagement. I think these are important conversations to have. I had this own conversation with my own pastor this morning. We were texting about this and he took one position. I took the opposite. And then he's like, well, actually you make a good point. I said, I said, brother, if you had taken the opposite position, I was going to take the other one. Cause I just think right now we're in a period of time that we need to look at every side of every issue to make sure we're not determining that our own feces doesn't stink and we're now just falling into idolatry. I don't know what the right answer is. Like, I think on one hand, you could look at the Democrats just imploding in real time and take that to mean God is giving us an opportunity to win this election. And then you could look at what Trump is doing to the party platform and on vital existential issues and saying God is testing us to see if we're going to revert back to Saul all over. I don't know. It could be both. I don't know. I don't know. But I think we need to be willing to entertain both sides of these conversations. Did I get that in a time? You did. More in a moment. Well, when you're living in a post-Christian culture, you've got to reset virtually everything. All right. So we we have gone from a culture founded on what historians used to call the Protestant work ethic to, hey, what's a work ethic? Like, what's a woman? Like, what's a border? What's a criminal? What's a marriage? All right. What's a baby? And that's where the new book by David Bonson comes in full time work and the meaning of life because we were created to work. And our work provides unique meaning and purpose to our lives. And yet today there is this crisis of apathy and ignorance where work is concerned, like there is where virtually everything else is concerned. All right. There's also no shortage of books telling people that you work less to be happy. I mean, that can be true. I mean, if you've turned work into an idol, yeah, you should not do that. Okay. Um, I mean, if you are sacrificing your family, all right, for some one more thing that in the grand scheme of things you wouldn't put on a tombstone. Okay, yeah, that can be a problem. But it's not, maybe that was more of a problem like in the 80s and 90s, Todd, right? Nowadays, is that nearly the problem that, that as, hey, I'm just going to hang out in mom's basement? That seems like the other thing's kind of the problem these yeah. days. Yeah, that's, and that's where this book comes into play, all right? Uh, because it is in our, any form of service or any effort striving we do with the gifts God has given us that we can discover more of our meaning and purpose and give God the glory. And that's ultimately the purpose of human life, to glorify God, all right? So if you want to check it out, you can purchase it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or just visit fulltimebook.com. Get the book there, fulltimebook.com. It's called Full Time, Work in the Meaning of Life by David Bonson at fulltimebook.com. All right, let's go ahead and get back to um, Ask Me Anything. Lynn Malone Watson asks, do you agree that if Rush Limbaugh and Fox News had embraced the Tea Party and supported Cruz, a true conservative, that the left might not be in control today? No. Um, I think Trump was destined to win that election. And remember, Fox News tried to take Trump out and couldn't. In fact, that was their third default position. They, they were originally all in for Jeb Bush and Scott Walker, and then they were all in for Marco Rubio. Um, I, I think Trump was just destined in 2016. If you look at the events that transpired, every, how everything went, um, I have... Okay, I'll say it. In... in, in if you put me under the Wonder Woman lasso of truth. Here's what I would say. That I, I actually do think Trump has some form of anointing. Not necessarily in the, the Paula White way. Well, I, can't dis- I can't disagree with Trump. Can't disagree with God. Not like that. But 
some form of calling in favor. I mean, who, who, who had on their bingo cards after convicting Trump of 34 felonies, Democrats would finally just decide to come correct about Joe Biden having to mention blow up their entire party over it. Did you have that on your bingo card? Mm. Did you? Aaron, was that on mm. yours? It was no. How about Hillary Clinton just never going to go to Wisconsin for a single campaign event? Did you have that one on your bingo card? No, no that one either. Okay. So I, I think there is something to it. I do. Just not in an idolatrous way, but um, in a Romans way. There is no power or authority ordained on earth except that which God has uh, permitted, allowed, ordained himself. My theological read is, I believe that Trump was brought forth to expose the system. And the first time he ran, it was to expose them. But since God is not a respecter of persons, right? We just discussed that in depth from Romans 2, correct? Yes. Okay. So God just, uh, in the Old Testament, God just judges the Gentiles and never the Jews? No. 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 In fact, the Jews get judged actually more harshly. Yes. Yeah. In the New Testament, um, God, the, the New Testament just condemns uh, the Romans um, for uh, trying to put Christianity down and makes no demands of character or integrity upon the Christians themselves. No. That's not how it works? No. 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 That's not how it works. So is God imminent or transcendent, Aaron? Both. Yes. Which means in the Old Testament, the Jews and, the, the, the Jews and Gentiles both get judged and the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, right? Yes. Because he's both imminent and transcendent, correct? Yes. And then in the New Testament, the church and the unbelieving world are both called to the same standard because God is no respecter of persons and he's both imminent and transcendent, correct? Yes. Yes. And so I think the first time the evidence and the signs are there that Trump was brought forth to expose them. And I think this time the evidence and the signs are there that he's being brought forth to expose us. That's what I really think. I think. That, that last part is everything. Expose us. The previous question before the break was about a future party. What can we do? This was about past events and things, but you're still, again, expose us. We, conservatives, Republicans, the people. Like, I don't, if we're really about families, things like that, are we really asking ourselves, like, why then are all the school boards across all of America, no matter where you are, dominated by leftists? See, we keep talking about system things outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Expose us. If you really want the things you claim about, this is why I put these questions from different angles. They're talking about the same thing. We, the people, are the problem. Yes. So I know, again, there's going to be a cadre of you that are going to say, well, after based on what you just said, how can you vote for Trump? It's what I think. I don't know. Did I receive a prophetic missive? No. It, it, it's what I think. I could be wrong. Everything I just said could be entirely wrong. Everything I just said about why I'm going to vote for Trump could also be entirely wrong. Some of it that I think is right could be wrong, and some of it that I think is wrong could be right on both sides. It could all be wrong. I don't know, guys. We are... I, I don't know. I've never lived through a cultural collapse. You? I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know. I do know that I think it is very important for us to be as honest with one another as we possibly can, to deal with each other with as much integrity as we possibly can. And, and I do know at a time where that was similar to our own culture in the book of Judges, God brought forth people you could be proud of like Deborah, and then he brought forth people like Gideon that you would not be proud of. And they would bring forth people like Samson that you'd never be proud of. I, I don't know. Here's what I know. All things work together for the glory of God and for those who are called according to his purposes. I know that. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it very often in the lives of others. I know that a God who would not spare his own son on my behalf can be trusted. Regardless of outcome. So though I am politically desperate that Trump wins this election, if he loses on November 5th, you know how much sleep I'm going to get? Same amount I would have gotten any one. Because I think it's a very important election. I also don't think in the end my eternity is based on it at the same time. See what I'm saying? 
this is a, these times require us to be nimble and to contemplate multiple things and angles at the same time. And we're not always going to agree while contemplating them, which is why we need to make sure we give each other grace for conscience and we're being honest and dealing with each other with integrity. And that's what I'm trying to do for all of you is be as honest as I can. Everything I've said this whole two hours, there's really almost no way to make money off this. I feel terrible to the Blaze sales staff. Good luck. Okay. There's no money to be made off of. We desperately need Trump to win, despite the fact he made two of the biggest mistakes that probably in a, in a righteous era would just have disqualified him forever holding public office again. I'm, am, am I going to get, uh, am I going to be the next uh, keynote at TPUSA with that speech? And I like TPUSA, mm-hmm. by the way, but I'm not getting booked saying that stuff, right? No. no. That, that's why I got booked there two years ago and I haven't gotten booked since because I've been saying stuff like that. See what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, that, that's not getting me booked anywhere. On the other hand, on the other hand, Am I rolling with Bill Crystal and the Bulwark Boys and uh, getting all their CNN engagements with, no, uh, hey, guys, remember the good stuff Trump did? We cannot afford for him to, li-. that's not working either, is it? No. So I, I, I'm not getting anything out of this other than it's what I really think. It could also be really wrong. I don't know. But I get paid to tell you what I think. And that's what I'm doing. Ready to move on? You bet. Ad Allen is next. I've heard you call the film and book The Shack heresy. Could you explain further? Yeah, it, it's based on a heresy called modalism. And modalism is essentially the idea that the Trinity exists basically in modes. So if you like read The Shack, which I did, there's even a line in The Shack where, it, where, where God says, we became Jesus. No, you didn't. In other words, that's a mode. Okay. Jesus has existed forever. Jesus is God. The very the beginning of the, the book of John basically mirrors Genesis. The entire book of Colossians pushes back on this sort of Gnostic heresy and creates what theologians will later call a Christology. Which, by the way, the first time we ever did a Bible study on this show, which book did we do? Colossians. Colossians. Because of the amount of confusion that would exist in an audience like this about who is Christ? Jesus is God. There has always been the Father. There has always been the Son. There has always been the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Incontrovertible, forever and ever. Creator, always be blessed and praised. Amen. No other God. It's always been that way. So, modalism is a heresy. Uh, there are some um, obscure vestiges of Pentecostalism that teach this. Some of you may have been taught that the Trinity is like water. Because water can be ice, vapor, and uh, liquid, right? Can it be all three of those things at the exact same time into perpetuity? No. It, maybe it can be several, it can be all three of them at a time of transition, but can, it ex- can they exist, can water exist in all three of those states for all of, e- per- for all of eternity? No. No, so that's not a good analogy either. That's what I mean. God has never been in modes. He was never like mad in the Old Testament, then nice in the New. Not true. You've read a lot of Paul's epistles. They're really not nice. <laughs> Including the one we're reading right now, as a matter of fact. All right? So, not true. Uh, the, the God who spoke to Moses at the burning bush, Jesus. The God who told the Israelites, go into Canaan and urban renewal the place, Jesus. God who sent the plagues on Egypt and against their foreign gods, Jesus. That's what it means. There's, there's not modes. It, now, it's more complicated than that. I'm trying to give the simplest explanation for the purposes of time and, you know, how much we really need to ponder the lint in our navel, but that's essentially what it means. It denies, modalism denies that God has existed as Father, Son, Holy Spirit for all of eternity. It denies that. Thus, it's a heresy. All right, one more uh, word about our partners, especially Jace Medical, before we close out with a couple more questions, Aaron. Because if there's anything we need in this day and age, it is dominion, as much of it as we can get. And Jace Medical offers that when it comes to our health care. Get a backup of some of the most proven antibiotics in human history before they're the next to be called horse-paced and dangerous. And then you can also expand and customize the Jace case to what you personally needed uh, backups of or a loved one needs backups of as well. I think this is a great thing to do if you've got elderly parents and grandparents. Chances are they're on Medicaid or Medicare. They're a complete ward of the state. 
at the mercy of the Francis Collinses and that Hydras of the world. So make sure they've got what they need just in case. Oh, that could never happen here. Happens again and again and again. So get the Jace case just in case. JaceMedical.com is where you want to go. J-A-S-E, even EpiPens, Ivermectin. Yes, you can get those in your Jace case when you customize it. JaceMedical.com, J-A-S-E, J-A-S-E for JaceMedical.com. Use the promo code DACE at JaceMedical.com. Next, we go to G.T. Levin, who says, if Trump wins, would that make it nearly impossible for a Republican to win in 28? Is it worth it to have Trump turn the whole country against Republicans for another four-year liberal Republican administration? Really quickly, there were like three or four questions along those lines. Like, uh, I, ha- I, ha- I have no idea, and neither does anybody else. Here's what I can promise you, though. I'm not going to take a lot of strong positions on this, except this one. If you are not going to vote for Trump because you are convinced the people will learn some lesson with another loss, you're wrong. And I know, I held your position. Three times. Held that position for 12 years. McCain, Romney, Trump 1.0. Gentlemen, after three successive losses, how many lessons were learned? A negative one. Or two consecutive losses, this is I should what say. what I'm trying to none, get across none, here. None. I held that position for 12 years. No lessons were learned. The candidates aren't the problem. The people are the problem. You expect too much of everybody else and not enough of ourselves. Correct. I do not believe there's going to be some massive uprising of Cuban Catholics against Rubio. I don't think it'll matter. <laughs> is that happening? Yeah. And, and frankly, given the current state of the Catholic Church, yeah. I think if you go to any form of Christian church, you're more, whether it's Catholic or not, you're more Catholic than most people calling themselves Catholics. And I would say that across the board. I would say Todd is more evangelical than most evangelicals I know. Knows way more of the scriptures and the word of God than almost than the ninety percent of the evangelicals I know. Because we are in a systemic failure as a society, and it is not confined to one system. It's the system as a whole. So if you think some lessons are good to be learned or you're doing some juju, no, 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 no. That's the dumbest take of them all. There's no evidence for that at all. That's the dumbest take. That I will vehemently argue against. Any other position you take on this, provided it's honest, and you're being honest about my position, Godspeed, brother, except that one. That's stupidity, and I just can't abide you being stupid. And I know it's stupid because I was similarly afflicted, so I know how stupid this is. And I don't want you to be as stupid as I was. No lessons are going to be learned. The people are the problem. Next, uh, Russell uh, Kearley says, is AI the most likely the next form of biblical level punishment? I don't know. I don't know. I think in the current condition we are in culturally, we can make a lot. I mean, (laughs) God God invented the human clitoris and told us to use it get married and use it and multiply we found a way to just completely turn that against us and invent dozens of strains of std you see what i'm saying there is literally nothing in 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 a godless culture with sinful hands that we cannot figure out a way to screw up so the short answer is yes yeah but i think it'll be it will not it's not the it's not the outside in it is it is not the innovation that causes us to go astray it's the it is the fact that we are all like sheep and have gone astray we will ruin said innovations people are the problem the people are the Again. problem yep man there were a couple remind us next time we do ask or um, ask me anything ask days anything there were a couple in there that were really good that just required a little bit more time maybe we should revisit those next time yeah save them for next time then all right okay all right that'll do it we're done Romans 828